it should be more, you know, yeah, I mean, so, than the T-shirt. Um, right, but I think the right the uncertainty here is it's higher. Well, it's high, it's but it's a logarithmic plot, so I think it just looks wider. I guess I don't know what the if you like, actually calculated the width of the band and converted it to linear units. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't. I'm, yeah, I mean you're going down several words in that. Yeah. So like, if you look at the lines as they write the word, that would. Yeah. yeah, but I mean I guess you still right. It's still like. Yeah, but tend I, to yeah. But I, I guess I'm talking about the, the fluctuations in the line. Like if you look at the the mean, right? Yeah. I mean I don't I don't know too much about this, so I don't know how you compute those. Like what mm -hmm. fluctuations are you to? But I think if you took off the mean. Yeah, yeah, so I think well, the, the magnitude of the fluctuations is probably similar. I think the other yeah, thing is that yeah. it kind of makes sense, right, if these are expansion opacities, and if we return to the last slide, or two slides ago, right, these are kind of average over, um, you know, these are like averages over bins and wavelength space, and so if you have more terms going into your average, or it's not quite an average, but it's a way of aggregating all the data, if you're putting more lines in, to that formulation per bin, which is what you would expect for more complicated um, atoms. There are just more lines going in. That's going to wash out some of the oscillation. Um, so that could also be part of it. Um, OK, but right. So take home point for this plot is just that if you once you start adding into your compositions these complex atoms that have their valence electrons in an open F shell, you really crank up the opacity. Okay, and um, the effect of this high opacity is of course going to have a major impact on the kinds of light curves and spectra that we expect to get, um, which you can see from these plots, which are the results of one-dimensional time-dependent radiation transport calculations of kilonovi carried out with the um, radiation transport code Sedona. So these are two models that are the same in every respect except for the composition. So you know the red curves represent that is rich in lanthanides, while the black curves show the results of um, a composition that, that lacks those high opacity species. So we have volumetric light curves on the left, and then spectra on the right, and you can see there are kind of three major effects that happen as you start um, adding lanthanides into your mixture. The first is that the light curves become longer, right? Instead of a very early peak, we have a long plateau. The light curves also become dimmer, and the emission becomes redder, right? We move from a black body centered here in the optical to one that is pushed out into like the, the near infrared, I guess. So um, I have one quick question. Sure. When you say lanthanide, yeah. you're also including the actinides, is yes. that right? Yes. Does it make a difference? Uh, it's not clear. So I think we talk about lanthanides because if you look at like our process nuclear network calculations, mm -hmm. well one, there are just more lanthanide they're, species. Yeah, that are sure, produced. they're more abundant. Yes. yes. Um, but so yeah, I think this is something that we were, I was actually just discussing with some, some nuclear physicists because they were like, don't forget about the actinides. Yeah, yeah, right. um, but yeah, I think we sometimes tend to use lanthanides as a stand-in for oh, oh. like high opacity half-shell elements. Yeah, so thanks. yes, um, thank you for that question. Um, right, okay, so there's just some simple physical reasoning that underlies the trend that we see here. So you know, as you increase the opacity, it makes it harder for the photons to diffuse out of the ejecta which explains the lengthening of the light curve. By the time the, the photons do are able to, to escape the ejecta, they've lost uh, more of their energy to adiabatic expansion, which causes the peak luminosity to decrease. And then this adiabatic cooling, combined with very high opacity at optical wavelengths, pushes the emission out into the infrared. So the more you know, lanthanides you have, more lanthanides and actinides you have in your ejecta, right, the longer, dimmer, and redder the emission of your kilonova is going to be. Um, so I just wanted to present this, uh, I, guess I just wanted to summarize this work that we did because I think it was you know, kind of important for establishing what we should expect from um, emission, well, from kilonova emission or you know, from the emission of any transient that, that was um, lanthanide enriched. Okay. So this brings us to part two. I'm going to talk about how this theory connected to observations um, once we were lucky enough to get some observation. So, right, the work I just presented actually predates the first undisputed detection of kilonova, but, um, you know, all of that, all of that changed in the summer of 2017 
with GW170817, which kind of gave us a chance for the first time to really see how well our theories matched reality. So, of course, the story starts with um, LIGO and Fermi, right? This is the gravitational wave detection. Um, this is a, a time frequency spectrum. So what it shows you is the frequencies uh, at which most of the power of this signal, of the gravitational wave signal, emerged. So this bright line just kind of traces the merger. You can see it started out at lower frequencies, and then as the neutron stars started spiraling together faster and faster, the, the peak frequency increased. And then finally we have the merger. Um, right, and then the GW signal was accompanied by a burst of gamma rays detected by Fermi. Both of the signals were kind of localized to the same region on the sky, which was searched by LIGO's electromagnetic follow-up mm -hmm. partners. Um, and you know, many, this is just kind of one um, one example of the killing of the discovery, but like many groups independently searched that region of the sky and discovered a, a, an electromagnetic counterpart in the galaxy that was about 40 megaparsecs away. So <coughs> just a summary figure to give you an idea of all of the data that was collected um, on the electromagnetic counterpart for this first neutron star merger. So you can see that this is clearly a very, very rich data set that really covers you know, almost the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So we were really, really lucky to get all of this, this detail, um, you know, and have such a rich picture of this transient. Um, but it turns out it's the, you know, it's the middle part of the electromagnetic spectrum that actually corresponds to the kilonova and the radioactive transient, which is what we're interested in um, if we want to study nucleosynthesis. So this figure, courtesy of Ashley Villar, um, aggregates all of the data that was taken in the in the optical and uh, near infrared um, bands, and so this is you know the data that we need to decode if we want to really understand uh, how much mass was ejected in this neutron star merger at what velocities and with what composition. Okay, so to interpret this, we carried out further radiation transport simulations. Um, so again, using the same Monte Carlo radiation transport code Sedona. Um, these are kind of just um, extensions of the models I presented earlier, which were done in 2013. Um, so as before, we have volumetric light curves and spectra here. Um, and again, these are just a suite of models that vary only in their composition. So the trends that you see here just kind of are the same, um, except you know we're showing the effect of gradually increasing or decreasing the lanthanide mass fraction. But um, you know, the story is the same. The more lanthanides we put in, the higher the opacity is, the longer and dimmer the light curves are, and the redder the spectra we become. So you know, armed with this suite of models, the question we want to ask is, you know, which of these best resembles um, the killing of all Are you the mass ejected? Yeah, so in these, in these models, we are. Because but we it's have a free parameter, and in principle, we can have the generous between x. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So I mean, we. Right, this is just uh, showing one particular mass and one particular explosion velocity to isolate the effect of increasing lanthanide mass fraction, but we actually carried out a full suite of these. Um, so, you know, changing mass, velocity, and composition. And then we started to play with some more complicated models, like what if you have a spatially varying opacity? Um, so, but that, yes, if you, so yeah, those were more like bespoke models, I guess, trying to really match the observations, but um, we had at least three parameters that we varied widely to try to best match the observation. Um, okay, right, but so if we go back to this lovely figure from Ashley's paper, um, you know, and we try to think about whether we see something that's kind of long, dim, and red, or bright, short-lived, and blue, um, we don't really see clear evidence for you know one of those or the other. Um, instead, we kind of see evidence for both, right? You have some bright blue, you have some bright early peak emission in the bluer bands that phased its away rapidly, um, and then you have you know longer lived um, emission in the in the redder bands that becomes prominent later on. So this suggests that there might actually be two different components present in the kilonova, um, corresponding to two different levels of lanthanide enrichment. So, and this is actually not that surprising because the R process can yield different compositions depending on initial conditions, right? So this, again, is a plot I will credit to Jonas Lipner. It shows the final abundance pattern burned by the R process for three different simulations. So R process nuclear network calculations are often parameterized 
um, in terms of expansion time scale, entropy per baryon, and this electron fraction, Ye, which um, confusingly is the number of protons per baryon. So the higher your Ye is, the more free or the fewer free neutrons you have around, um, and vice versa. So again, these are final abundance patterns um, presented in terms of mass number. Okay, and what you see if you look at these, right? And so again. Um, here, entropy and expansion time scale are fixed, and Ye has been allowed to vary. So as long as you have a fairly low Ye, corresponding to a fairly high number of free neutrons when the R process begins, it's pretty easy for you to build up the heavy elements, um, including the lanthanides, and we could put another gray bar here for actinides, but including these elements that are responsible for giving you a high opacity. Um, but once you, you know, reach a threshold a value of electron fraction, you just don't have enough free neutrons around to produce these high opacity species um, in meaningful quantities. So instead you'll just produce light R process elements, or if you get all the way to Ye of 0.5, which is like stellar matter, um, you're just going to burn nickel 56, and what you really have is like a 1A supernova. Um, okay, so you can make the argument that, you know, regardless of the variation we see here, we would still expect a neutron star to, to kind of be in this regime because, or a neutron star merger to be in this regime because you're starting with a big ball of neutrons. Um, you know, you should always have a very low electron fraction. But weak interactions can actually act to turn neutrons into protons and that can raise the Ye and change the outcome of the R process. So the abundance pattern, even from a neutron star merger, is not going to be set in stone. So what that means is that the presence, the apparent presence of multiple components, you know, based on our reading of the Kelenova light curves, actually tells us something about the diversity of environments and the role of weak interactions in the outflows from this neutron star merger. Excuse me, can we go to 